second event in our new book club um, where we're trying to present our authors at Liverpool University Press who publish in our slavery series, the Liverpool um, Studies in International Slavery. You can talk to our editors in our press at the back. Um, to wider audiences. So um, I'm really, really thrilled to have someone come and talk about Liverpool memorialisation and public history, Dr Jessica Moody, um, who we just published her book in 2020, which she's going to talk about. So Jessica is working uh, as a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, but she's had academic posts at Portsmouth University. I'm trying, to, trying, to, I'm trying to remember off by heart. Really? You, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got it on paper anyway, I've highlighted it any of the highlights. Mm -hmm. um, but you've also worked at the National Museums of Liverpool. Before that, you've worked at the University of York. So you're coming back to Liverpool for some of the things that you've learned, uh, researched and put together over the years. Um, this isn't your, this is your first single authored publication, but you published with the press in 2016, an edited collection. I'm going to confess I don't know the title off by heart, but I would like people to know. So that book was called Britain's History and Memory of Transatlantic Slavery. Um, and so your work is on public history and memorialisation of cities like Bristol, Liverpool, but you have done comparative work with the amazing Stephen Small, who was originally born in Liverpool, um, but at Berkeley now um, in California, um, comparative analysis um, of the memory of big houses and stately homes and heritage in the UK and the US. Finally, and I don't want to take over your talk, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, um, you're doing community projects um, in Bristol at the moment. Again, I've, it's called uh, Decolonizing Memory, Digital Bodies and Movement. Um, and this is about memorialization and decolonization, but it's also about performance and dance too. Um, so I'm sure people would love to hear about that as well as your uh, recent publication. So I'm gonna hand over to you to tell us all about your book. Um, I have read it already. In fact, I had it on my shelf. And then when I saw that we had the opportunity to invite you um, for our second book club talk, and this is our first live one because the first one, I was in the US and we had to do it on Zoom with someone in the UK. Um, I was looking a bit tired that day. Um, but So this is our first in-person book talk of this new adventure, and it's called The Persistence of Memory, Remembering Slavery in Liverpool, Slaving Capital of the World. And so our book club is with our Centre for the Study of International Slavery, um, which I forgot to mention. I'm the director of, so I'm Laura Sandy, that's why I'm standing here. But over to Jessica to tell us all about her new publication. <coughs> to uh, the Centre and to Liverpool University Press for bringing along books and wine. Um, and thank you very much to the Kungo Amani Centre for hosting this talk. Uh, I was last here, I think, 2013, a long time ago, to give a talk for Black History Month, so it's really nice to be back here again. Um, as Laura said, I'm going to talk to you today about research from my book, which came out in 2020. And as I'm sure you know, this was a very eventful year in relation to thinking about how slavery was or indeed should be remembered in our public spaces. The book, which as Laura said, is titled The Persistence of Memory, Remembering Slavery in Liverpool, Slavery Capital of the World, aims to add a historical context to these more recent events by tracing the history of the city of Liverpool's public memory of transatlantic enslavement from the end of the 18th century, when the port was still heavily involved in the slave trade, through to the 21st century, by which time a number of public history, commemorative and heritage projects have been created which sought ways to face this difficult past. So the book therefore maps an evolving public memory of transatlantic enslavement in Liverpool the largest of the European slave trading ports by far, from history to memory, and across different sources and spaces, including the built environment and urban landscapes, newspapers, anniversaries and commemorations, museums and galleries, black history interventions and politics, written histories and guidebooks, to name just a few. Mapping the public memory of this difficult past, one which nonetheless had a tremendous impact on the wealth, development and culture of Liverpool and of course much of Europe, reveals not how difficult pasts are forgotten, as much generic commentary may put it, but rather the ways in which dissonant pasts <coughs> persist over time, unevenly navigated, framed and packaged 
emerging and re-emerging largely through the form of a contested public debate. The last few years have seen a public reckoning with the history of enslavement of African people in Europe and America at a volume not witnessed before. Large-scale protests by Black Lives Matter activists in the wake of the murder of George Floyd by police in May 2020 have drawn into sharp focus issues of public commemoration and at times celebrations of histories of slavery, empire and white supremacism, which in my hometown of Bristol, of course led to the statue of slave merchant Edward Colston being pulled down and thrown in the harbour from the side of Perrow's Bridge, a bridge named to commemorate Perrow Jones, an enslaved man living in Bristol in the 18th century. The history of how Liverpool has remembered enslavement is of direct relevance to many other places. Liverpool has had more permanent and repeated forms of public history, commemorative and heritage interventions around histories of transatlantic enslavement than any other city in Britain, arguably in Europe, including a permanent gallery since 1994, the marking of Slavery Remembrance Day since 1999, the year the City Council also issued an official apology for the slave trade, and since 2007, a permanent dedicated museum. This is important now in relation to revived moves for places and institutions, including beyond the familiar port cities, to consider their connections to this history and how such pasts are marked in public spaces. Many places are therefore looking to Liverpool for its more pronounced public memory of enslavement. This is a memory, though, that has a contested history of its own. Going back over 200 years, this is a public memory of transatlantic slavery in Liverpool that can be mapped over time. And it's telling for what it reveals about public attitudes, certainly to race, slavery, and empire, but also to the evolving use of the past in an ever-changing present in broader processes of identity and place and an ongoing negotiation of meaning. I'd like to start with what I hope would be an illustrative and useful vignette. The somewhat controversial image on the cover of the book is a photograph of one figure on a well-known monument in Liverpool, the Nelson Memorial located in an area called Exchange Flags. Exchange Flags was once the heart of 18th century Liverpool's financial and trading district, where <coughs> traders would exchange their cards, their flags, as part of this trade. The traders included those trading in enslaved African people, cotton traders and brokers, who until the mid 19th century traded the products grown by enslaved labor in the US South. The Nelson Memorial was Liverpool's first publicly funded monument, and from its unveiling in 1813, the four chained figures around the statue face have remained at the centre of a long and contested debate which has persisted for 200 years over symbols, imagery, and the ambiguity of meaning that memorials can embody, revealing the ways in which difficult histories can be both present and absent in public spaces. The Grade II star listed monument, designed by Matthew Coates Wyatt and overseen by Richard Westmacott, was created to commemorate Admiral Horatio Nelson as a supreme English naval hero following Nelson's death at the Battle of Trafalgar in October 1805. Numerous other monuments were erected around Britain and its colonies in Nelson's honour at this time, from Birmingham to Barbados. <coughs> Liverpool's coinciding rise in maritime confidence was well-placed and well-timed to celebrate this heroic naval figure through public sculpture. The project committee consisted of a number of important civic and commercial figures who had investments in the slave trade and plantations in the Caribbean, including John Bolton and John Gladstone, as well, well as Liverpool's most well-known abolitionist figure, William Roscoe. Around the pedestal sit four semi-nude male <coughs> figures in chains. Officially, these represent Nelson's four victorious battles. 
However, they also introduce striking yet contradicting ambiguous visual allusion to Liverpool and slavery. Whilst the use of chain figures aligns to a broader sculptural tradition of the time, no other memorial to Nelson included figures in chains. And yet two of the designs proposed for Liverpool, both by designers with connections to the city, did. The inclusion of these chained figures within Liverpool's first public memorial, located behind the 18th century town hall, a building which also has engravings of the faces of African women adorning its exterior, at a time when the city was at the height of its involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, and indeed when abolition was being most publicly debated in the run-up to 1807, is unlikely to be a coincidence. At the very least, these figures could hold a dual symbolic function. The figures could represent both French prisoners of war and the suffering of African slavery, especially perhaps given William Roscoe's involvement in the project, a connection a number of historians have made, including Alison Yarrington and the architectural historian Quentin Hughes, who suggests the four chain prisoners may also be a subtle allusion to Roscoe's hatred of the slave trade. One letter, published in the Liverpool Mercury in 1813, after the monument was unveiled, <coughs> reveals the beginnings of what would be a long-running debate over what these figures meant. The author stated that, quote, a prodigious outcry has been raised against the four figures in chains, that many have claimed it <coughs> a shock to see such a galling exhibition of slavery in Britain, for, as the poet says, slaves cannot breathe in England. And here he's drawing on the familiar words of the poet William Cooper's poem and the Somerset ruling of 1772. The author dismisses such assumptions, stating instead that the statues represented prisoners of war, shifting the focus of the debate around these figures away from slavery, and indeed Liverpool's part in it, to a more acceptable and concurrently prominent area of national discourse by issuing some anti-French rhetoric in a derisory tone. In answer to this, this is what he says, in answer to this, I beg leave to ask, are not these figures intended to represent prisoners of war? And have we any, any assurance that they have been put on their parole? For my part, I never trust a Frenchman, and I have not the least doubt that if the chains were taken away, these monsieurs would quickly scale the palisades and take French leave without waiting for the ceremony of being regularly exchanged. So this letter illustrates how, from the moment of its unveiling, there was a reactionary debate prompted by the chained figures. The chained figures, whilst perhaps not explicitly or singularly representing enslaved Africans, do imply a symbolic connection to them. There is an additional level of irony to such symbolic memorial connections given Admiral Nelson's own opposition to abolition and what he saw as the, quote, damnable and cursed doctrine of Wilberforce and his hypocritical allies, <coughs> as he wrote in one of his letters. This attitude, of course, echoed much of the official response and pro-slavery sentiment from Liverpool's own 18th century <coughs> political and mercantile elite, who toasted their slave trade at functions and sent petitions against abolition from the town hall just meters from this statue. The ambiguity of interpretation has created a porous terrain onto which a memory debate can take root and unfold. Herman Melville, the 19th century novelist, probably most uh, well known for writing Moby Dick, also wrote a largely autobiographical work called Redburn. The central <coughs> character, Redburn, recounts a visit to Liverpool in the 1840s where Melville more overtly aligned the figures he saw surrounding Nelson on the base of this memorial with enslaved Africans. He states, quote, these woe-begone figures of captives are emblematic of Nelson's principal victories, but I could never look at their swarthy limbs and manacles without being involuntarily reminded of poor African slaves in the marketplace. These connections Redburn makes to slavery are rationalized through the more obvious aesthetic qualities of the sculpture's physical fabric. That it is impossible to look at literal black bodies in chains, the swarthy limbs and manacles, 
or figures rendered in bronze and treated with <coughs> a black patina without thinking of the enslavement of African people. This has been the contradiction in engagement across the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Slavery-themed walking tours, taking visitors to the statue, recounting the significance of exchange flags for the trade in humanity, whilst being criticized in the local press for doing so. TV programs like <coughs> Host and Time Team explored the contested imagery, and histories, guidebooks, and local public debate as to co continue to navigate the possibility of this dual symbolism for over 200 years. So the Nelson Memorial itself reflects connections between Liverpool and slavery like a black swarthy mirror, hinting at potential connections without explicitly making them. The bodies in chains have come to fulfill a form of figurative shorthand for the city's involvement in the slave trade and perhaps by extension its memory. The emasculated male figures, semi-nude and bearing heavy chains, look passively at their feet in the shadow of the 18th century town hall with its decorative emblems of the city's trade with Africa. Yet these figures who surround a national maritime hero both reveal and obscure Liverpool and slavery. Their obvious connections to enslavement through chains jar against their categorical description as allegories of war victories. And I think it's also interesting to note at this point in time and in the context of recent events that the statue of Nelson in Barbados, uh, one of the many that was erected around the same time as Liverpool's statue uh, around the British Empire, was removed from Bridgetown in Barbados in November 2020 because of Nelson's support for slavery. So I've put the contents page of the book up on the slide, and um, of course real physical copies exist at the back of the room, um, and the book is available for free online as an open access text. Uh, and I'd be happy to discuss any other areas in the question and discussion time at the end of this talk, and obviously this, this talk is going to be necessarily selective. So today, what I'd like to do is focus on three key themes of, re of the research, methodology, and the overall argument of the book. So firstly, the book traces the public memory of transatlantic slavery from history to memory. This reveals the ways in which the particular and specific shape of dissonant histories determine their unfolding memory, especially as defined in relation to place and place identity. Secondly, in looking at dissonant memory across a long durée, over a long period of time, here over 200 years, it is possible to follow and map out multiple and recurring overt memory work, such as the successive marking of anniversaries and commemorative occasions. Thirdly, in looking at a broad range of source areas over this long time period, and beyond the well-known activities at the end of the millennium, this research reveals how this dissonant past persists, the form that this takes. So far from being absent for 200 years, there has been a public memory of slavery in Liverpool, which has persisted through public debate and within public discourse, a persistence that works more in the shadows, in ambiguity, through myth and counter myth, unofficially unfolding over time, even in the face, or perhaps because of the more long-standing official omissions and silences. I called the book The Persistence of Memory because dissonant pasts persist. They persist and are dissonant <coughs> through their form as a contested public debate. This persistence is not uniform and it is not forged and it is forged through both continuity and change. Here are some results from a search. <laughs> 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 That's, uh, uh, they found the answer on the internet. I didn't need to write a book. <laughs> the uncanny familiarity of an evolving slavery memory discourse over time, shaped by changing circumstance, other historical events, 
phenomena and people, contestation and challenge, and reinforcement along its trajectory. So the book starts its long chronological journey at the end of the 18th century, in the midst of the history whose public memory is its thematic focus. Liverpool's history of slavery has shaped its memory of slavery, especially as this relates to civic identity narratives long after abolition and emancipation. So this is probably the one place that I don't really need to outline this context, but I will do so anyway. Of the British ports involved in the transatlantic slave trade, none transported more enslaved African people from Africa to the Americas than the port of Liverpool. Recent scholarship has estimated that the total number of enslaved African people taken in Liverpool ships to the Americas was around 1.4 million. Proportionately, this means that two thirds of the total number of African people sold on the coast of Africa between 1750 and 1807 were sold to a Liverpool ship. By comparison to other British slave trading port cities, Liverpool's involvement was by far the largest and no other major British port broke that one million mark, which Liverpool surpassed. Liverpool rose to its position of dominance in the transatlantic slave trade towards the end of the, the 18th century. And between 1801 and 1807, a total of 790 ships were deployed. And figures from 1807, the year that the Abolition Act was passed, show that the city invested its largest amount of money into the slave trade at this time, a staggering 2.6 million pounds. While other British port cities' investments in the trade had waned by this time, Liverpool's grew, reaching its peak in the decade before abolition was passed. The growth of the abolition movement and subsequent public debates marked a distinct shift in public popular discourse over the subject of slavery. Britain was embroiled in a public debate, and pro- and anti-slavery rhetoric flooded the public sphere. Liverpool, as Britain's preeminent slave trading port at this time, found itself in the midst of, and often the target of, this abolitionist ire. So around this time, Manchester denounced Liverpool for selling shackles in its shops, and similar criticisms were aired in the Leeds Mercury. In retaliation, Liverpool's elite enacted rituals of solidarity by toasting its slave trade at functions and ringing the bells of churches following the defeat of the first abolition bill in 1791. Liverpool's public memory of transatlantic slavery has in part been shaped by the specific nature of its involvement in transatlantic slavery through th three major themes, black Liverpool, dominance and time. Liverpool's intense involvement in the slave trade, the 18th century trading relationships with African elites, alongside later developments in the trade with West Africa into the 19th century, led to the development of Britain's oldest continuous settled black African descended community. The presence of African descended people and crucially their experiences in Liverpool have shaped the city's public memory of slavery in a number of integral ways through racialized discourses, outright racism, and colonial and imperial narratives, and crucially, the black resistance to this. Liverpool's black communities have challenged the omissions and misrepresentations of Liverpool and slavery through forms of public history, which have focused in particular on alternative forms of education, writing in the local press and through radical black presses, and teaching in further education institutions like the Charles Wooten College, and in private history walking tours such as those conducted by Eric Lynch since the 1970s. Beyond the sheer scale, investment and involvement, one of the most distinctive facets of Liverpool's rise to dominance in the transatlantic slave trade was timing. Liverpool's involvement reached its apogee towards the end of the 18th century, coinciding with both the intensification of public debate around slave trade's abolition, but also with broader cultural changes. And here memory came to play an increasingly significant role in the construction and maintenance 
of the collective identity of imagined communities, to borrow Benedict Anderson's much used term, at the beginning of the 19th century, which also coincided with the increasing professionalization of history as a discipline of study. The rise of local and regional centers seeking greater distinction from the broader identity of the state saw towns and cities such as provincial Liverpool establishing their own unique identities through the writing of history. With the exception of Enfield's 1774 essay, Histories of Liverpool, begin with James Wallace's General and Descriptive History of Liverpool, published in 1795. <clears throat> this book sought to inspire pride in the city's livelihood, and the sheer scale of Liverpool's slave trade was presented as its raison d'etre. This is illustrated through Wallace's emphasis of this dominance through fractions. So he says things like that one fourth of the ships belonging to the port of Liverpool are employed in the African trade and so on. Similarly, guidebooks designed to be carried by visitors which contain historic overviews begin to be published in significant numbers only at the very beginning of the 19th century. The writing of Liverpool's story, therefore, coincides both with the apogee of its exceptional rise to dominance in the slave trade and with historiographical, so uh, shifts in the writing of history and broader cultural moves to forge a formal collective civic memory of place and people. This converging happenstance of history and memory forged distinctive discursive legacies in the form of identity narratives, competitive tones, foundation myths, and some classic Scouse boasting by stressing the importance of the slave trade to the city alongside efforts to imbue a sense of civic identity and pride. This process began and continued with a positive endorsement of maritime mercantile endeavor and a celebration of the city's seafaring expertise which flourished through the enterprising spirit of her people, demonstrated in relation to slave trading. And in the written text consi considered, this is commonly expressed competitively, where Liverpool's successes are greater than her rival port cities of London and Bristol. Throughout the 19th century, however, these identity narratives are awkwardly reworked against an increasingly prominent national anti-slavery discourse, a process which left contradictory contradictions in its wake. So we have texts such as John Corrie's 1810 History of Liverpool, which suggests that it was, quote, that adventurous spirit which has since distinguished the merchants of Liverpool, and that furthermore, it was the perfect knowledge of the commerce of the British West India Islands, which meant that, quote, the traffic to the coast was engrossed by Bristol, till Liverpool advancing in wealth, population, and enterprise endeavoured to participate in a species of commerce which, however repugnant to the feelings of humanity, was productive of opulence. So in this quotation, Liverpool is presented as clearly beating Bristol in competition for this slave due to its enterprise. However, the inclusion of the clause at the end reflects the problematic nature of deriving pride from a success in slave trading, meaning that the author brushes aside any moral arguments against it instead falling back onto the unquestionable amounts of wealth as a point to note. The frequent deployment of this enterprising spirit motif and this idea that Liverpool won a competition with Bristol and London was familiar enough by the 1860s to be able to be satirized within a comic history published in the political and satirical journal Porcupine in 1863. Here, editor uh, and writer Hugh Shimin outlines how, quote, in 1720, this traffic had been abandoned by London. The London dog, grasping at the shadow which he saw in the depths of the South Sea, let fall the piece of black flesh which he had been carrying in his mouth. Bristol would have seized the tempting morsel gladly and run away with it. But Liverpool was then, as she is now, energetic and enterprising. So she cut in and cut Bristol out, and Bristol has scarcely ever held up her head in a decent way since Liverpool carried off the slave trade. 
critical of Liverpool's contemporary support for the Confederate States during the American Civil War and staunchly anti-slavery, Hugh Shimon is here knowingly drawing out the curious cliches of Liverpool's historic narrative of slavery for ridicule, presenting the competition with rival ports as if it were the fighting of dogs over scraps of meat. In 1907, the centenary of the British Abolition Act of 1807, and more importantly for local context, Liverpool's 700th birthday, Ramsey Muir, professor of history at Liverpool University, presented Liverpool's dominance in the slave trade against other port cities in a highly competitive tone, where, quote, Bristol had been beaten in the race, London was far behind, and the second, in the second half of the century, Liverpool was beyond all competition, the principal slaving port, not only in England, but in Europe. Similarly, the first uh, city council authorized produced guidebook was also published in 1907 and stated that, quote, by far the larger number of ships were employed in the West African, in the West Indian trade, which had grown to importance. Out of this trade sprang the slave trade, which was wrested from Bristol. And here, I think what's curious is that the image of the slave trade pre is presented as springing from a more generalized West Indian trade. And this gives the trade itself a sense of agency, as if the slave trade created and managed itself. The representation of slavery in the official city council published guidebooks to Liverpool in the 20th century maintains the precedent set within this commemorative guide. And this line concerning the springing of the slave trade and its resting from Bristol is retained word for word into the early 1970s. The narratives <coughs> outlined here are replicated and repeated in different contexts. Although outlined largely in regard to written histories, guidebooks and discourse around commemorative events, Liverpool's distinctive identity narrative of beating other port cities is reproduced in response to other public history. Old habits die hard, and accordingly, within reporting concerning the opening of the Transatlantic Slavery Gallery in 1994, the local press reported that Liverpool beat competition from London and Bristol to house the gallery. So, in tracing this public memory over a long period of time, the research reveals the dissonant memory's uncanny persistence, the stubborn repetition of arguments and mythologies, as well as the changing shape of memory over time. One dimension to this kind of uh, long uh, process of analysis is the ability to map out cultural processes which recur and repeat including commemorative occasions and round number anniversaries. The use of round number anniversaries to shape a particular kind of mythology around Britain and slavery has occurred largely through the overt celebration of dates connected with abolition and emancipation. So 1807, of course, more recently marked in 2007, but initially 1833 and 1834 as the dates of the Emancipation Act outlawing slavery in the British Empire. And these were marked at mostly 50 year intervals, so 1883, 1933, and 1983. And as, then, as I say, we have the bicentenary of the Abolition Act more recently in 2007. So in taking this longer historical view of the history of memory, a unique and important moment of coincidence of different commemorations is seen in Liverpool with distinct ramifications for the performance of identity. Little research has yet been undertaken into overlapping and coinciding anniversaries over time, and their public marking tells us much about changing attitudes to the past and its uses in the present, the elevation and de-elevation of some pasts over others, and the awkward dissonance of overlapping histories deemed as celebratory or difficult. The city of Liverpool takes as its birthday the year 1207, the date when letters patent were granted by King John, designating Liverpool a free borough. In 
1807, the Act for the Abolition of the British Slave Trade was passed by Parliament, marking the end of an activity in which Liverpool had been heavily involved. From 1907 onwards, when Edwardian Liverpool was first, first started celebrating its birthday in grand public ways, the two moments met in awkward and contradictory juxtaposition. Though downplayed and partially obscured, Liverpool's role in transatlantic slavery could not be completely silenced from the various enactments of a coherent identity narrative in 1907, 1957, and of course, 2007. However, the silences that do stand out represent a distinct organized forgetting, to use Paul Colleton's term, a process which relied on actively rearranging, contesting, and resignifying Liverpool's memory of slavery in line with changes in the global, contemporary, national, local context. These coinciding commemorations form part of the dissonant poetry of Liverpool's slavery memory and uses these round number anniversaries as illustrative moments of organized and ritualistic activity. And they here form useful prisms through which to view Liverpool's public memory of slavery at moments of heightened promotion and collective civic pride. <coughs> so starting with the earliest of these dates, 1907, Liverpool's 700th birthday, this was celebrated as the three graces were being built on the waterfront at a high point of imperial pride for the city and was marked in order to, quote, stimulate, stimulate civic pride and patriotism and, especially in the young, encourage the growth of a higher citizenship and bring Liverpool more prominently to the notice of other countries. Uh, these were the words of the town clerk at the time. Liverpool and slavery was a subject framed in the celebrations in line with broader discourses of philanthropy and civic patriotism. The grand historical pageant, the centerpiece of the celebrations, performed a narrative of Liverpool's historic story through 12 horse-drawn cars in overarching time periods. The slave trade car pictured on the screen was embedded alongside more comforting histories of local philanthropy in a section titled Period 9, Wealth and Charity, and more specifically, The Beginning of Wealth, Well-Gotten and Ill-Gotten, and of Charity, which covereth a multitude of sins. <laughs> the official pageant program described the scene of the slave trade car, including the decorations of chains and manacles, which apparently, quote, gave an awesome reality to the idea of slavery and explained the roles of the actors who sat and walked around the car. These included men playing the parts of the, quote, celebrated slave captains, John Newton and Hugh Crow, and enslaved Africans, performed by black men of African descent in this pageant. Local press reporting clearly illustrated how the parody of performance could be seen to sanitize a traumatic past. As the Liverpool Courier put it, quote, and at, the, at each end of the car to give realism to the scene was a group of Negroes, while at the back was shown a slave driver <coughs> with his whip, but which did not appear to be a very formidable instrument of torture. On each side of the car were six slaves and a driver, but in the true spirit of pageantry, all appeared in the happiest of moods and on the best possible terms. One article, concerning the slave trade car suggested instead that the men playing these roles, quote, though appearing as slaves harried by cruel drivers, were typical of the modern freedom and prosperity of the colored brother. However, the suggestion that the contemporary treatment of black people was one of freedom and prosperity was something which was contemporarily being challenged in the local press. Edward B. Hines, a man of African descent living in Liverpool, outlined the discrimination he faced finding employment on board ships because of his skin color. Interestingly, he drew on the history of the slave trade and the ongoing exploitation of Africa and Africans at this point in time to emphasize this point, a phenomena he suggested which lay at the foundation of Britain's wealth, that quote, 
the ships and the great wealth of this country of which they boast are the tears and blood of my forefathers. Fifty years later, the commemorations in 1957, Liverpool's 750th birthday, more closely uh, aligned with wider argumentative and overtly racialized discourses of imperialistic paternalism, derogatory and racist attitudes, and the influence of more recent abolition memory making in Britain. The Charter celebrations in this year sought to present post-war Liverpool as a modern industrial city by drawing on narratives of progress and events which celebrated industry, as John Belcham has put it. In a city still physically fragmented by the devastation of the Second World War, the need to talk progress and illustrate recovery to potential investors and to the psyche of the local population is powerfully apparent. The position and significance of transatlantic slavery in 1957 was significantly downplayed alongside much more moral justification and distancing than had been the case in 1907. Resident abolition hero figure, William Roscoe, received far greater attention, and there was a more pronounced elevation of abolition than had been the case 50 years before. Intermediate anniversaries and their accumulative effect have shaped the tone and content in this case in 1957. So the large-scale national commemorations of the centenary of emancipation, which took place in 1933 and 1934, pushed the celebration of abolitionists further into the public sphere. The main activities uh, in 1957 concerned exhibitions and addressed Liverpool's relationship with different places, such as Africa, America, Asia, Europe, the Commonwealth, and the United Kingdom. The International Library was itself opened by special guest dignitary, Mr. Jacob Luku Alotoy of newly independent Ghana, who was presented with a copy of George Chandler's History of Liverpool, published to celebrate the city's 750th birthday, which claimed that, quote, in the long run, the triangular operation based on Liverpool was to bring benefits to all, not least to the transplanted slaves, whose descendants have subsequently achieved in the new world standards of education and civilization far ahead of their compatriots whom they left behind. So lucky him. The exhibition prompted a telling article within the Echo, the exhibition between Liverpool and Africa, which stressed the need for a sense of perspective on the city's slave trading past and praised this exhibition for showing it. The author of this article, Ian Stevens, adopts a system of rhetorical questions, each referring to an area which he set out to dispute. A city built on the slave trade, the opening line of the article asks, to which no is presented as the only logical answer. The slave trade in humanity is thrown into doubt by the example of white historic trauma, of women used as pit ponies, and so on. Later in the article, Stephen suggests that slavery, here echoing Chandler's claims, had positive consequences, whereby, quote, the Africans were taken from their backwardness and forced to create new worlds. They escaped into slavery from the juju rights and mass killings. They have built a culture that is now a Western institution. Out of it has risen the only true Negro middle class in the world. It still fights prejudice, but will win when most of us are still alive. So this justifying tone of imperialistic paternalism was continued by Stevens throughout the rest of the article where he suggests that Liverpool was continuing to help Africans through the African Steamship Company, Lever Brothers, and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Through these developments, apparently, Stephen argues, Liverpool's pride became restored. In the 100 years since Liverpool's civic authorities first sought to publicly and officially celebrate the city's founding charter, the reach of such activities have broadened tremendously. Globalization and its effects on cultural tourism, in particular, have propelled the local into the global and vice versa. And the significance of Liverpool's birthday celebrations have been disrupted by other national and transnational commemorations 
and symbolic titles. Firstly, Liverpool's 800th birthday in 2007 was largely overshadowed by the city's forthcoming year as European capital of culture in 2008, a distinctly transnational celebration. The promotion of 2008 was, moreover, presented as a milestone moment in the narrative of the city's economic rebirth. Secondly, 2007 was marked nationally as the bicentenary of the abolition of the British Slave Trade Act, and a whole swathe of activities took place across the country, in archives, museums and beyond. Whilst the national focus on the bicentenary meant that the history of the slave trade and abolition took a more prominent position than Liverpool's 800th birthday, it also meant that the slave trade was decoupled from Liverpool's civic identity narratives. Paradoxically, and through this compartmentalization of memory, slavery featured least in the birthday celebrations of 2007 compared to 1957 and 1907. So the final theme I'd like to talk about is persistence. So this theme concerns how dissonant history persists. In looking beyond overt acts of memory work, like museums and commemorations, what becomes apparent is the way that difficult histories persist through debate, through contested public discourse, and through stories and mythologies which recur over time. Whilst Liverpool has quite a wide range of memory work relating to the city, uh, relating to slavery, the city has no public memorial to transatlantic slavery or to the African and African descended people who suffered through <coughs> it. Despite this absence, Indeed, maybe because of it, numerous unofficial lieu de mémoire, to use Pierre Nora's term, so sites of memory, have come to perform a commemorative function. Against the tangible stage of the built environment, it is the human connections, the bodies of the enslaved themselves, which most commonly and evocatively fill such gaps and cleave to Liverpool's physical urban terrain. These bodies exist as figurative emblems, both in their presence as physical sculptured artistic adornment on statues and buildings, which embrace ambiguous connections by performing symbolic functions, such as with the Nelson Monument mentioned <coughs> earlier, but also in more intangible recurring mnemonic provocations. This revolves most potently around the intangible stories of a Liverpool slave presence seen not to be told, the publicly unacknowledged lives of enslaved people, bought and sold, who lived and died in the cityscape. The prospect of enslaved pe people living in, or more contentiously being sold in Liverpool, is a central and recurring point of debate within the city's slavery discourse. Slave sales have been discussed in Liverpool's long history of <coughs> slavery memory in an illusory language of myths <coughs> and legends, folklore or local tradition, which is often hooked onto specific places. One of the most prominent of these sites of memory is Quarry. Ramsey Muir recounted how the legend which pictures rows of Negroes chained to staples in gory piazzas exposed for sale is a curious instance of popular superstition. Or more elusively, Gory Piazza suggests old slaving days, as Lewis Lacey claimed. Here the name of Gory alone conjures up associations with slavery, the buildings having been named, quote, in commemoration of the African trade, then so prosperous in Liverpool, as a 19th century history put it, bearing the name of an island Gore, off the west coast of Africa, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The public debate around slave sales and gory was dis has been disturbed by the historical record and the discovery of historical archive material uncovered nearby. So this is what happened in 1931, when an invoice was discovered, uh, which, claimed, which was for a cargo of 209 men women and children, shipped in 1773 in the Julia from Old Calabar. And this was found in a nearby warehouse in a cellar and prompted a newspaper debate about Liverpool and slavery more broadly. 
again connected back to this area of Goree, to the sellers and to enslaved people. The Gori warehouses were partly destroyed during the Blitz and later demolished between 1948 and 1950. However, their association with slavery, the enslaved and specifically slave sales, continued long after their demolition. Gori has become an intangible place where, quote, legend asserts that slaves were sold, as architectural historian Quentin Hughes claimed in 1968. Here, memory has emerged through absence, settling into a more mythical status where, quote, the story that African slaves were once chained to the metal rings in the now vanished gory piazza near the pier head is one of the classic images of Liverpool's brutal past. As one of Liverpool's journalists put it in the 1990s around discussions of the development of the Transatlantic Slavery Gallery. In the case of Gori, Architectural change has mirrored broader memory structures, where narratives celebrating abolition have also been used to try to displace narratives of slavery around this cont contested site of memory. Urban landscapes change and develop. Buildings go up or are brought down, but Liverpool slavery memory debate has persisted. After the Gory warehouses were demolished in the 1950s, a large office block was constructed on the site closest to where the Gori piazzas would have stood. This 1960s concrete tower was commemoratively named Wilberforce House, after William Wilberforce, the nationally celebrated abolitionist whose bicentenary of birth had recently been marked in 1959. The office block, designed and built by Gotchen Partners in 1965 to 1967, was given the name Wilberforce House to celebrate a national hero, one whose commemoration in name few would take issue with, and whose celebration has long obscured the full acknowledgement of Britain and slavery. Despite this naming, however, Gori and its immediate vicinity has persisted as a site of memory <coughs> through its function as a place for stories of slavery to gather, rooted in their human embodiment, like a memorial haunting persisting within the absences, ambiguities, and contradictions of a contested past, and layering over time and place. So to conclude this talk, what I hope I've shown is that dissonant memory persists. It resurrects itself. It haunts and will not stay dead. For over 200 years, the memory of slavery in Liverpool has persisted through a contested public debate. Mapping the memory of this past from history to memory has revealed the ways in which the specifics of history and place continue to shape its remembrance. Very little of this talk today has concerned itself with analysis of more recent authoritative and organized forms of memory work in the city, such as the International Slavery Museum, Slavery Remembrance Day, or other projects from the 1990s. Though of course you can read more about this in the book. Instead, I've taken a longer view, one which I hope shows the long history that more recent narratives about this past have. One of my uh, peer reviewers for the book manuscript commented that they were surprised not to have heard more about the slave ship Zong in the book draft. So for, you, for those of you who don't know, the Zong was an 18th century slave ship which was owned and insured by Liverpool merchants whose captain ordered the murder of 132 African people by throwing them into the ocean in order to pursue an insurance claim after stocks ran low. And this case, when it was legally challenged, was used by abolitionists as an example of the inhumanity of the transatlantic slave trade and has therefore formed a really important facet of abolitionist memory. The absence of the Zong from Liverpool's public memory of slavery is notable but not entirely surprising. Firstly, Liverpool does not have the same easy celebratory relationship with Britain's dominant culture of abolition, having had more of a history of actively campaigning against abolition. Secondly, slavery has in general in Britain been misremembered, maritimized, and dismembered from identity narratives and place for the past two centuries. So much of the twisted heart of the history of slavery, the human trauma, happened at a distance 
from the European metropoles which masqueraded <coughs> it. That a ship owned by Liverpool merchants, including an 18th century mayor, and insured by Liverpool merchants, and an event so publicly fought over, could be forgotten from the city's own memory narratives of transatlantic slavery, is a product of this distancing and disavowal, and of its displacement through other maritime narratives. The memory of other ships, sea-bound images of romance and exploration, mercantile endeavor, enterprising spirits, and imperial might. More recent interventions by black Atlantic artists in the memory of Gazong bring us back to the essence and purpose of researching the history of memory in this way. Caribbean-Canadian poet Marlene Nobese Phillips' poem cycle Zong uses the 500-word legal transcript of the 18th century trial to disturb the history of slavery, to meditate on absence, forgetting the unknowable past and trauma. She uses techniques of whiting out and blacking out words, erasure, mutilates and murders the text as she describes, castrating verbs from the trial. As Philip explains, Zong is the song of the untold story. It cannot be told, yet must be told, but only through its untelling. I hope this research and the book can contribute to this untelling. To tell any difficult history, its memory must first be untold. The historical deconstruction of memory means picking apart and illuminating memory's construction, looking behind the scenes, into the mechanics, the human-made inner workings of the ways in which difficult histories have been remembered and misremembered over time. Writing the history of memory is part of the untelling of difficult pasts that must happen as part of their telling, by naming the mythologies and revealing their construction by knowing and taking apart the uneven persistence of their fraught memory. Thank you. Yeah.